Hello there, you're watching Alt24 News coming up next in our news program. UK Home Office said today Friday that British government is planning to label the whole Palestinian Hamas movement as a terrorist organization plus. The Austrian government has ordered a nationwide lockdown for unvaccinated people to combat rising coronavirus infections and deaths. And finally, Germany's energy regulator has suspended approval procedures for the Nord Stream 2 pipeline to transport Russian gas to Europe, which prom prompted a rise in gas prices in Europe to about 12%, causing a supply gas crisis before winter. Hello again and welcome. Algerian Ministry of Trade and Export Promotion communicated the participation of 60 Algerian exhibitors and institutions active in various sectors in the second edition of the Intra-African Trade Fair 2021 in an area of 600 meters square. The exhibition is taking place from November the 15th to November the 21st in Durban, South Africa. Building bridges for a successful African free trade area is the main slogan of the exhibition, which is organized by the African African Import Export Affirmix Bank. This event hopes for developing the economic sector in Africa as well as intensifying efforts to support economy actors in the continent through promoting African free zone for more exchange and export of various commodities on the continental level. On its part, Algeria aims for more promotion for the local products and developing the nation's production and finding new markets on the continent at a time when regional powers are fighting to dominate the African market. And to talk more about this economic fair taking place in uh, South Africa, I'm joined here in our studios by Arif Abdel Jalil, Commissioner of Youth Peace and Security at Partner Africa uh, Youth Union. First of all, uh, under the slogan of building bridges uh, of successful African free trade area, what is the role of Algeria is going to play in the African continent economically? Well, uh, thank you for having me uh, with you. So uh, Algeria is seizing its uh, role in, the, in promoting for uh, economic integration within not only the regional but also uh, the continental level. Algeria is uh, doing its best to position its economy and also promoting, as you have already said, uh, promoting the local products. Algeria is uh, for sure is trying to, uh, Algeria, it's worth mentioning that Algeria was one of the first signatories that ratified the uh, free trade agreement, Africa Free Trade Agreement, AFCFTA. So uh, Algeria is doing its best, as I said, to promote for local products and also to have a, a better integration of economy. As I said, the Algeria relies on uh, promoting two sectors mainly, the, the agribusiness and the food processing, which uh, are which there relies many, many pro opportunities uh, where Algeria can uh, uh, increase its, um, uh, its uh, export uh, bills and also uh, mo and moving from millions to billions exports. So that's what uh, the objective of the Algeria economy is uh, aiming to achieve. Indeed. Uh, secondly, what are the main sectors of economic exchange between Algeria and other African countries that could be beneficial for both? So, uh, we, without uh, mentioning the numbers, it's obvious that uh, during the period of the COVID-19, uh, especially in Algeria, we saw that um, two sectors were, let's say, not that much uh, uh, touched by the uh, pandemic effect. So, the, the two are uh, the agriculture sector and also the uh, tech industry. So, in the agriculture sector, it's where Algeria uh, performed best and uh, they are relying on exporting uh, all the different uh, agricultural products because uh, we know that uh, 
most of the African uh, develop, developed countries, they are in the need for uh, food and uh, for all the uh, agricultural products. That's where Algeria is planning to, uh, to, to play its role by reducing the tariffs and also to uh, promote also for the um, transport infra infrastructure. It's where Algeria now, for instance, uh, Yesterday, they have launched the export uh, campaign to uh, Nawakshot and also to other, uh, there will be other uh, campaigns to other African countries. So as I said, Algeria integration in the economic, uh, in the continental uh, free trade area is becoming more and more resilient. And that's what is needed. Because other African countries, they rely on the uh, support of uh, Algeria, not only at the diplomatic level, but also when it comes to the socio-economic development. Thank you so much, you Arif Abdel Jalil, Commissioner of Youth Peace and Security at the PYU. You joined us here in our studios. Thank you. And now moving on to another story. And in a statement by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Algeria strongly condemned the terrorist attacks in the Ugandan capital, Kampala expressing Algeria's support to the Ugandan people. It's worth mentioning that the last Tuesday, a twin suicide bombing has hit the Ugandan capital, Kampala, which resulted in the killing of six people and injured 30 others. Let's follow this report. Algeria condemned the attacks in the Ugandan capital, Kampala, on Tuesday, which left six people dead and 30 injured. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs stated that Algeria supports the Ugandan people and government against the terrorist aggression, and extends its deepest condolences to the families of the victims and wishes a speedy recovery for the injured. The statement added that the Ugandan people will know in these difficult times how to mobilize their strengths and overcome these difficult situations. The Algerian Foreign Minister stressed that eliminating terrorism requires active solidarity at the continental level, as well as increased cooperation to revitalize the mechanism put in place to confront this ever-growing scourge. Police spokesperson Fred Enanga says 21 suspects have been arrested and that all information suggests that this attack is linked to the radicals of the ADF, Allied Democratic Forces. The hallmarks of the attack clearly indicate that the ADF-linked radicalized groups uh, who still have a desire to carry out lethal attacks on soft targets using suicide attackers and uh, improvised explosive devices uh, behind these attacks. This comes within the framework of Algeria's efforts to combat terrorism in Africa, where the last Monday, Ramta Mamra, Minister of Foreign Affairs and National Community Abroad, called before the ministerial meeting of the Peace and Security Council of the African Union for the need to formulate and adopt a comprehensive and integrated approach aimed at addressing the root causes of terrorism. Still with the same story following the twin explosions on Thursday, Uganda police have killed five suspects as they tried to escape from Uganda to DR Congo and arrested 21 people as part of the investigation into twin suicide blast that killed four people. Authorities put blame on domestic terror groups which are linked to the Allied Democratic Forces. Sid Islam reports. According to officials, following twin suicide attacks claimed by an ISIL offshoot that killed three people, Ugandan police have killed five suspects and arrested 21 others. At a news conference on Thursday, police spokesperson Friend Ananga said that counterterrorism officials in the country's west killed four suspected terrorists in Toroko who were crossing back to DR Congo. Sheikh Abbas Mohamed Kerivu, a local Islamic leader who was responsible for reawakening the terror cells in Kampala, was killed near the city as he tried to avoid capture. Police also arrested 21 people as part of a crackdown on the Allied Democratic Forces, an armed organization active in eastern Congo that has been connected to ISIL. Police arrested a number of suspected ADF operatives following the incident and warned that others were believed to be plotting a new attack on major installations. 
The twin attacks, which left at least three people dead and 33 injured, were the least in a series of atrocities in the East African country. Last month, the ADF claimed responsibility for a bomb containing nails and shrapnel that exploded near a popular street-side restaurant strip in Kampala's Kwampi district. Longtime President Yori Masovini, a U.S. security partner who was the first African leader to send forces to Somalia to protect the federal government from the Al-Shabaab armed group, has been a target of the group. Washington linked the ADF to the ISIL, which in 2019 began to claim some ADF attacks on social media, presenting the group as its regional branch. The arrests followed a bus explosion near Kampala that wounded many people and a bombing at a roadside eatery in the capital that killed one woman. China has moved its focus to asserting control over peacetime activity across the South China Sea since completing the construction of its artificial island basis in the Spartly Islands in 2016. The growth of China's marine militia, a group of vessels supposedly engaged in commercial fishing but actually working alongside Chinese law enforcement and military to achieve political goals in contested waters has been a crucial component of this transition. According to a fresh allegation, hundreds of vessels are being sponsored by Beijing to back its expanding claim in the disputed waterways. Despite UN agreements control international waters, China has aggressively expanded its nine-dash line, leaving many of its neighbors with little alternatives for reclaiming their territory. Around 300 vessels from China's marine militia monitor the Spartly Islands in the South China Sea, as Beijing maintains its contentious claim to the disputed waters. Vietnam, the Philippines, Malaysia, Brunei and Taiwan all claim parts of the South China Sea, where China has built artificial islands with airstrips, sheltered ports and other military infrastructures. China's marine militia dates back to the 1950s coastal defense operations. Since taking the parcel islands from Vietnam in the 1970s, the militia has grown in size and scope, aided by government fundings for fuel, construction and repairs, and has become an important tool in Beijing's territorial and maritime claims. Three Chinese Coast Guard vessels were accused of blocking and firing water cannon or resupplying boats heading for Philippine-controlled atoll in the South China Sea, which the Philippines condemned in the harshest terms. According to Philippine media, the majority of activity has avoided violent confrontation. Although militia tactics escalated in 2019, when a Chinese vessel struck and sank a wooden Filipino fishing boat anchored northeast of the Spartly Islands, before being rescued by a nearby Vietnamese boat. Experts have described China's maritime militia as a classic illustration of its gray zone tactics, which allow it to enforce its sovereignty in places where all the countries have competing claims without resorting to traditional combat. U.S. President Joe Biden welcomed his Mexican counterpart and Canadian Prime Minister to the Three Friends Summit. Biden stated that the summit is about what the three countries can do today as partners and in mutual respect to strengthen the region and demonstrate that democracies can deliver results in the 21st century. For his part, Justin Trudeau expressed his happiness for being part of this discussion that will shape the course for the future. On the other hand, Andres Manuel Lopez stressed the advantages of economic integration, describing it as the best way to confront China. In their closing statement, the three leaders pledged to work together on migration and climate change without talking about any concrete steps and announced a new summit in Mexico in 2022. Democrats postponed a vote on Joe Biden's $1.75 trillion back be better bill after House Speaker Kevin McCarthy delivered an extended parliamentary statement that blocked efforts to pass it. Marwa Belaiwa reports. Biden signed into law the infrastructure package, which primarily allocates federal funds to repairing roads, bridges, tunnels, and other transportation systems, and has eventually traveled the country praising its benefits to voters. After an independent government agency predicted the spending measure would add $376 billion 
to the federal debt over the next decade. Nancy Pelosi, the Democratic Speaker of the House, announced that the lower chamber of Congress would vote on it. This agenda invests in long-term economic capacity and will enhance the ability of more Americans to participate productively in the economy. Steny Hoyer, the Democratic House Majority Leader, informed legislators that the vote would be held on Friday morning after McCarthy invoked his privilege to speak indefinitely from the floor. This bill is truly for the people, not just those who have much, but those who have too little. Many Americans are looking at the investment. Administration in a four-hour speech that criticized everything from COVID-19 restrictions to migration at the U.S.-Mexico border. For nearly four years, as the House Republicans have been voicing the needs of millions of Americans, House Democrats have broken nearly every rule and standard in order to silence dissident and stack the deck for their radical, unpopular agenda. Despite that the White House has insisted that the bill would be fully paid for, moderate Democrats have raised concerns that the package will increase the debit while many Americans are concerned about raising inflation. German Chancellor Angela Merkel said when speaking to the Association of German City Leaders, the fourth wave of COVID-19 hits Germany with full force. She described the pandemic situation as dramatic as COVID-19 cases rise significantly. Zahra Fergeni reports. Germany's Angela Merkel has described the COVID-19 situation in her country as dramatic, as the outgoing chancellor considers how to deal with an infection rate that has hit a record. The present pandemic situation is dramatic. I can describe it differently. The fourth wave has hit our country with full force. And even though there is legal ground for the pandemic national emergency situation, I have no doubt that we are among such a difficult situation. Merkel's comments come after the Robert Koch Institute, Germany's public health body, reported a further 52,826 new cases Wednesday and a further 294 deaths. To date, Germany has recorded 5.1 million cases and almost 100,000 fatalities from COVID-19, according to Johns Hopkins University. The daily figure of new COVID-19 cases is higher than ever before during the pandemic, and the number of patients is raising very rapidly. And what's also frightening is the number of deaths in the country. Several states and cities have already imposed more COVID measures and have required the public to show COVID passes, which have an individual's vaccination status or if they've just recovered from the virus in order to access public areas. The Austrian government has ordered a nationwide lockdown for unvaccinated people to combat rising coronavirus infections and deaths, a step that comes after authorities are concerned about rising infections and deaths that soon hospital staff will no longer be able to handle the growing influx of COVID-19 patients. Let's follow this report. Austria will become the first country in Western Europe to reimpose a full coronavirus lockdown, a step from the Austrian authorities to tackle a new surge of infections. Starting from Monday, a national lockdown will apply for a maximum of 20 days, a lockdown that will be evaluated after 10 days until we end automatically no later than December 13th. From this date onward, no lockdown will apply for vaccinated and recovered people. Schallenberg said his government would look to impose the national vaccine requirements from the 1st of February. The conclusion that has been reached is that we will initiate countrywide compulsory vaccination. This will be applied from February 1st next year in 2022. The move comes only days after Austria took the unprecedented step of imposing lockdown measures for all those aged 12 and older who are not fully vaccinated against COVID-19. Many other European countries are imposing restrictions as cases rise. Hungary, which neighbors Austria, is making wearing masks indoors again compulsory, while the Netherlands has reimposed a partial lockdown. 
German leaders have agreed to reintroduce restrictions for unvaccinated people in areas with high COVID hospital admissions. It is worth mentioning that anyone breaking these measures may face a fine of up to 1,500 euros. Inflation rate hits the top around the world and supply chain issue is worsening the shortage of food supplies as food prices rocket in post-pandemic areas. Ayedi Usama. World's economy is reaching one of the worst situations in ages. The surge in consumer goods prices is rising in a scary way. And even biggest economic powers around the globe are facing an economic collapse, which resulted in inflation. The UN has recently warned that global supply chain crunch is likely to further fuel inflation around the world. World economy polls, including China, the USA and the UK, are witnessing a push-up in consumer prices. This price soar is due to supply chain issues that biggest shipping companies are facing, in addition to oil and gas prices, which increase in a scary way. Economists believe that COVID-19 pandemic and bottlenecks imports are the biggest threat to the world's economy. This inflation rates wouldn't be unprecedented, as during the financial downturn in 2008, inflation rates rose to 5%, compared to the current 3% rate. Governments and populations are concerned about the issue, and inflation is being felt all around the world, and worry of economists show that prices are going in a one-way direction, which will further complicate matters for economy superiors and consumers. Germany's energy regulator has suspended approval procedures for the Nord Stream 2 pipeline to transport Russian gas to Europe, which prompted a rise in gas prices in Europe to about 12%, causing a supply gas crisis before winter. Natural gas prices in Europe jumped again on Wednesday after a delay in the approval process of a new major pipeline from Russia, which could postpone its operation until March next year. The delays in approval process for the Nord Stream 2 pipeline is raising fears that Europe, which gets third of its gas from Russia, could face electricity shortage this winter due to poor supplies. Nord Stream 2 was started in 2018 and finished in September by Gazprom, which is owned by the Russian government. It would transport 55 billion cubic meters of gas from Russia to Europe per year. The pipeline has always been controversial because it bypasses Ukraine pushing countries such as the United States to worry that it will strengthen Moscow's influence in the region. The European Union imports around 40% of its natural gas from Russia, and that dependence is anticipated to continue even as the European Union converts to cleaner energy sources. Because of the increasing gas and electricity prices, experts, anti-poverty organizations and environmental protesters have warned that millions of people across Europe may not be able to afford to heat their home this winter. After a year-long protest against new farming laws, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi announced that his country would repeal the three contentious agricultural laws that he believed were put with good intention. Prime Minister of India Narendra Modi announced that his government would make reforms in the controversial farm laws, a decision that aims to overhaul the country's struggling agriculture sector. Three agriculture laws that farmers have been protesting against for more than a year would be repealed, Modi announced in an address to the nation. Today, I have come to tell you, the whole country, that we have decided to withdraw all the three agricultural laws. In the parliament session starting at the end of this month, we will complete the constitutional process to repeal these agricultural laws. Modi maintained that the farming laws were brought in with good intentions by the government. However, they failed to convey this to the farmers. The Indian prime minister admitted his government failed to win the argument with small farmers. Today, while apologizing to the countrymen, I want to say with sincere and pure heart that perhaps there may have been something lacking in our pious efforts, due to which we were not able to explain to some farmers the truth which was as evident as the light of the lamp. Maybe something was lacking in our penance, which is why we could not convince some farmers about the loss. In a tweet, Narendra Modi said his government decided to repeal the three farm laws urging the protesters to return home. 
The Indian Farmers Protest is an ongoing protest where tens of thousands of farmers march to the capital Delhi to protest farming reforms against three farms acts which were passed by the Parliament of India in September 2020. Farmers will continue the protests until laws will be officially repealed. Iran restarted its planned nuclear work resulted in a report by the International Atomic Energy Agency which urged the country's government to give more explanations about the activity while Gulf Cooperation Council U.S. partnership showed concerns about security in the region. Ayedi Usama has more. Conflict between Iran and UN is reaching advanced level in dispute and complications. Ahead of Vienna talks, a report by the International Atomic Energy Agency has been released, which raised concern and skepticism over the increase of uranium stockpile in Tehran, which has been urged to give explanations about uranium particles in non-declared sites of the country. Iran's acting representative in UN Vienna-based headquarter exhorted a making a rushed or politically motivated statement. However, he gave no further elaboration. Mohammad Riza Gaibi immediately responded to the report, and he explained that Tehran notified the agency of the move of purifying uranium up to 60%, and his country is cooperative with the UN despite technical difference issue. This International Atomic Energy Agency report overshadowed the next round of Vienna talks, and according to experts, it will facilitate the task to Europe to put more pressure on Iran. On the other hand, Gulf Cooperation Council and U.S. strategic partnership condemned a range of what they call dangerous and aggressive policies, which is likely to threaten the security of the region. And Gulf Cooperation Council members briefed on their efforts to build effective diplomatic channels with Iran to prevent, resolve and de-escalate conflicts. In a National Atomic Energy Agency report accused Iran of starting its banned nuclear work after the withdrawal of the USA from the 2015 deal and reimposed sanctions on Tehran, while the latter insists it has never sought developing nuclear weaponry. UK Home Office said today, Friday, that British government is planning to label the whole Palestinian Hamas movement as a terrorist organization. Home Secretary Priti Patel will push for the change in Parliament next week. Ayadi Osama again. Palestine's most famous military defense group Hamas has recently been on the spot by UK government, as this letter considered the group as a terrorist organization. UK's Interior Secretary Priti Patel announced to the British media that even supporters of the group or those who show any sort of inclination to the Palestinian group are susceptible to face jail sentence that can reach 10 years and wearing clothes that suggest support for Hamas, arranging meetings for the organization or publishing an image of its flag or logo would lead to the same conclusion. Patel is likely to address the British government against Hamas to consider it fundamentally anti-Semitic organization. This comes in a situation when Zionist forces are expanding the war crimes against the Palestinian population, and this last decision will further complicate the international opinion about the human rights and the problematic situation of the country. UK's Home Minister argued an outright. Ban under the UK's Terrorism Act 2000 was necessary because it was not possible to distinguish between Hamas political and military wings. This move would bring UK in line with the United States and Zionist occupation forces, which all designate Hamas as terrorist organization. Hamas political official Sami Abu Zuhri stated that defending the country with available means, even armed resistance, is a legitimate right and that UK's decision is totally biased to the Zionist occupation. And finally, we're up a Power News edition with a report on worldwide football. Let's have a watch together. First goal is Stamford Bridge. Tuchel thinks Lukaku could play against Manchester United on Sunday. Chelsea manager gives an update on contract talks with Andreas Christiansen and Antonio Rodiger, Conor Garrother's season-long loan at Crystal Palace will not be cut short, according to Tuchel. I think winning prices... You know, Scotland's Rangers football club named Giovanni Van Bonkors as their new manager on Thursday, replacing Steven Gerrard, who left for Aston Villa. Dutch national played for Rangers during playing career winnings two league titles. Yesterday afternoon, the team tweeted, quote, Giovanni has agreed to become the 17th permanent manager of Rangers club.
The number 8 was previously worn by many important players in the history of Catalan club, including Guillermo Amori, Arthur Milo and Mira Lampianic. The club announced Tuesday that the veteran fullback Dani Alvec will wear the number of former Barca legend Andres Iniesta. The Reds are still within touching distance of leaders Chelsea and in no need of panic. After all, Liverpool were the only unbeaten side in the division before their defeat at the London Stadium last time out. And before we wrap up, let's have a reminder of our main top stories. UK Home Office said today, Friday, that British government is planning to label the whole Palestinian Hamas movement as a terrorist organization. Austrian government has ordered a nationwide lockdown for unvaccinated people to combat rising coronavirus infections and deaths. Germany's energy regulator has suspended approval procedures for the Nord Stream 2 pipeline to transport Russian gas to Europe, which prompted a rise in gas prices in Europe to about 12% causing a supply gas crisis before winter. That's all for now. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.